We've been studying the book of Mark for some time now, and today is the last uh, sermon in a kind of a three-part series, and where we're learning about uh, Jesus preparing his disciples and preparing the church for what is to come, and now for what we experience every day in life, and especially across the globe where the church is persecuted beyond measure. We don't experience that too much here in the United States of America, but um, I assure you, someday it will come. Uh, it's just a matter of time. So Jesus is preparing his disciples, and this uh, it's a series of really interesting events, kind of crazy events, um, that really have uh, especially liberal Bible scholars scratching their heads because they can't make out what Jesus is doing. They can't figure out what he's doing. It's, it seems like Jesus is angry. Uh, he's having maybe some temper tantrums. We don't, we, liberal scholars don't know how to explain it. Well, we know how to explain it because we read the Bible in context and we also have a, a sense of, of Genesis to Revelation, what we call canon sense. We can, we're not going to lift the passage out and go, well, what's going on here? We can see it in context and we can see what Jesus is doing. Jesus is expressing uh, this this. His, not really just his surprise, but his disdain for the way that he is finding the world. The word of God through whom and for whom the world was created is now coming into the world, uh, meeting the world head on. And, and what's most disappointing is not just seeing his creation, how his creation is not ready for him and not prepared for him. They're not, we're not laying out the red carpet for him. But most importantly, his very people, his chosen people from Old Testament times, who he set apart to not only uh, worship him in spirit and in truth, but also show the nations, to show the world to be a light, right? A city on a hill for the world to see the holiness and the loving character of the, of the God of creation. And so that the world could see who God really is because the world is full of false gods, full, full of idols, and, and people need to see who the one true living God is. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, he's with his disciples, and he's encountering the scribes and the Pharisees. These are religious professionals in Israel. And they're not happy to see him. They really hate him. So much so that we find here in Mark chapter 11 and 12, they start to conspire against him to kill him. We're going to discover later there's actually one of his disciples. Do you know his name? Judas, who's going to conspire with them to kill Jesus, to deliver him up. Now he warns his disciples on two or three different occasions that this is going to happen. In just the previous days leading up to this event that we're going to talk about today, he's already told his disciples that he says the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, he's going to be handed over, and he's going to die. And, and it's just a week from what's happening in these last couple of days. So there is a sense of urgency with which Jesus is speaking to his disciples. So verse 15 through 26 is going to be our text. Starting in verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to cast those who were buying and selling in the temple... And overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a robber's den. And the chief priests and the scribes heard this and began saying, or seeking, how to destroy him. For they were afraid of him. For all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. And whenever evening came, they would go out of the city. And as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. And being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, behold, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it shall be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they shall be granted you. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, 
If you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. Wow, there's a lot going on here. First, we see the spectacle in the temple in verses 15 through 19. In verses 20 through 24, we see Jesus commenting again. Actually, the disciples bring it up. Peter brings it up again. The fig tree. And we looked at last week. And then the final part, 25 through 26, is all about prayer and not being a hypocrite when you pray. Now, all of this, again, as we've been looking at the last couple weeks, it's all about Jesus' authority. All of chapter 11 and 12 are all about Jesus' authority, that Jesus has authority, but... One of the things about the Gospel of Mark is presenting Jesus in such a way that his creation doesn't bow down before him as it should. The fig tree not producing fruit when its creator shows up on the scene. Even though it's out of season, that's no excuse, right? People can reject him. And yet the demons can't help but cry out. When he shows up. This is one of the mysterious things about Jesus and about the gospel. When he comes on the scene, he commands the wind and the waves to be still and it obeys his voice. But people, people still have the choice, the ability, being created in the image of God, God gives human beings the ability to reject the gospel. To say, nope, to Jesus. So when Jesus comes into the temple... We don't see people saying, oh my gosh, he's here. Fold up the tables. Send everybody out. No. What does Jesus have to do? He has to flip the tables over. He has to run people out. And he says, my father's house, the word says, my father's house shall be a house of what? Prayer. But you have made it into a robber's den. I want to read something for you. I think this is such a good synopsis of of what's going on here. This is from a New New Testament commentary from a Reformed theologian. Kiestemacher says, Jesus then has entered the court of the Gentiles. He's talking about the great Herodian temple. Because that's the temple that Jesus enters into. Now King Herod transformed the landscape in Jerusalem. The temple was incredible. Everything that he did was welcomed by the Jewish people. He was doing a great job. This is the temple that Jesus enters into. A lot is going on there. Kiestemacher says, What a sorry spectacle greets his eyes, ears, and even his nostrils. He notices as he happened also, as had happened also in the early part of his ministry, that this court, hence the temple, was being desecrated. It now resembled a marketplace. Business was booming. Lucrative too. Some men were selling oxen and sheep. At this time of the year with Passover so close at hand and pilgrims crowding into the court from everywhere, there were many, many buyers. They paid high prices for these sacrificial animals. True, a worshiper could bring in an animal of his own choice. But if he did that, he was taking a chance that it would not be approved. The temple merchants had paid generously for their concession, which they had bought from the priests. Some of this money finally reached the coffers of sly, wealthy Annas and the clever Caiaphas. It is therefore understandable that the tradesmen and the priestly caste were partners in this business. He says as Jesus enters, he notices the hustle and bustle of all those buyers and sellers. Also the noise, the filth, the stench. Produced by all the animals. Could this in any sense, whatever, he asked, be called worship? Can you imagine the scene? Can you place yourself there? Just for a moment and see kind of what's going on. The sights, the smells, the sounds. Is this what the temple is supposed to look like? Buyers and sellers, verse 15 says. There were buyers, there were sellers, there were money changers. See, foreigners were not allowed to use their own currency. And many foreigners passed through Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, the temple of Herod was in such a place to where it was on, people, transient people would go right past it. And many foreigners would come. You remember in the book of Acts, when Philip ministers to the Ethiopian eunuch? 
It were those types of people, sojourners coming through Jerusalem. Many Jewish people we see in Acts, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1 and 2, were there in Jerusalem as the apostles were given the gift of tongues to speak in other languages. Jewish people from all around the world who came to worship but had other languages that they spoke. This was a busy place. And they would come and they couldn't use their native money to purchase animals for the sacrifice. And so there was an exchange that happened. The money changers would exchange for a price. They would charge interest. They were charged a fee. Not only that, there was a temple tax. It would go to the priest for keeping the temple up. The sacred temple was being used entirely for secular purposes. But all in the name of God. We're just setting the stage for what Jesus is going to do. Jesus was furious. He was furious. He calls the temple a robber's den. He says it was intended to be a house of prayer. But you have made it a robber's cave. Does anybody's Bible say cave? That's literally what that word is. A cave. Where secret things happen. Where people who have robbed others go in in the privacy of the darkness and they count their loot. That's what Jesus says that the priests have made the house of God. Likewise, Paul says in the book of Romans, whenever he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God and the salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He talks to the Greeks in chapter 1 about how the Greeks, why is it that the Greeks need the gospel? Because even though a long time ago everyone used to worship God for who he was, they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the, of corruptible man. And then he talks to the Jews in, in chapter 2. And he asks this question, You who teach others to obey the law, do you not also disobey the law and then he asked this question do you who abhor idols this is the idea of holiness right I hate I hate false gods right I hate idols he says you Jewish people who hate false gods do you rob temples Paul asked that question Paul was very familiar with what happened in the temple during his day and during Jesus day He asked them that question to address the hypocrisy that was going on in the temple and with the worship there in Jerusalem. Now, let's get some Old Testament understanding of what's going on here. In Malachi chapter 2, the last Old Testament prophetic book before the great centuries-long silence until Jesus comes, the last Old Testament book is talking about when the Messiah comes, why does he need to come, what is the state of the Jewish nation at that moment, what's the state of worship and the temple. Listen to this. This is in Malachi 2 verse 9 where the prophet says, I also have made you that is the nation of Israel, despised and abased before all the people, just as you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality in the instruction. Okay? Partiality in the instruction. In Proverbs 16, 11, the Bible says, a just balance and scales belong to the Lord. And the weights of a bag are his concern. So think about what's going on in the temple, the money exchange, the cheating, cheating foreigners out of their money, misrepresenting God. This has been going on for centuries. But now, now the Lord has come to his temple. It's his. It's not theirs to do with however they want. In Micah 6, 6 through 16. You may remember a part of this passage, Micah 6, 8. That might be, for some of you, one of your memory verses. It's very popular. I want to give it in context. Again, this is the prophet 
Starting in verse 6. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? You get the, the, the picture here. The picture is the picture of the temple. Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. The voice of the Lord will call to the city, and it is sound wisdom to fear thy name. Hear, O oh tribe, who has appointed its time. Verse 10 is, There yet a man in the wicked house, along with treasure, treasures of wickedness, and a short measure that is cursed? Can I justify wicked scales and a bag of deceptive weights? For the rich men of the city are full of violence. Her residents speak lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. So also I will make you sick, striking you down, desolating you because of your sins. We get an idea throughout the word of God. That when it comes to worship, when it comes to coming into the house of God with the community of God to worship, it matters what we do. It matters how we live from Sunday to Sunday. It matters how you live in your workplace as a Christian. Are you fair? Are you ethical? Do you make ethical decisions in the workplace and in your family? Because God doesn't care about our songs. They don't impress him. God's not impressed with the way that we dress. He's not impressed. It, we go to all these Old Testament prophets and read time and time again, his people just don't seem to get it. They keep showing up for worship. They keep presenting doves and rams and goats and bulls for sacrifice and oil. Over and over and over. And he says, I don't, I, I don't hear you. I'm not listening to you anymore. You can clang your cymbals as loud as you want. You can weep. You can flood the altar with tears. But I'm not listening to you. Because you do that and then you leave the temple and you live com in a completely different manner. Now that's one thing. But now the Lord of the temple comes to his temple and it's not just happening outside of the temple. Now it's happening in the temple. It's so bad. This is just no more pretending. Even the priests are in on it. Extorting God's people. Extorting the foreigner when they're supposed to be a light unto the nations. So why is all of this happening? Why, what is Jesus going to do? He's going to show his disciples and he's going to show us as the church. He's going to answer that question. How is the church through years of persecution and, and even through years of favor, how is the church going to survive? How are we going to thrive? How are we going to make it? The first part of our series was about how in the world... It was about readiness last week. Right? The fig tree was not ready. The first message that we looked at was about willingness. Willing to give your life over for the Savior. The fig tree wasn't ready. And now Jesus is going to address the issue of ability. How are we able? Where is our hope? Many times what we do is we put our hope in systems and mechanisms. Jesus says, don't put your hope there. He talks about prayer. This could easily be a topical series or a topical message about prayer, but I think it's so much more. But I want you to see what he says in Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, I know I'm giving a lot of context for this morning's message before we get to the, the points. The points are going to go really fast here in a minute, okay? Okay. But in Luke chapter 18, again, he's talking about prayer. He was telling them a parable, this is in Luke 18, 1, to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. Saying, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. And there was a widow in that city 
And she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. And for a while he was unwilling. But afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection, lest by continually coming she wears me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. <laughs> now shall not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? See, Jesus knows. He knows the faithfulness of the Father. He knows the power of the Father. He knows what the Father is ready to do. He knows that the Father can move mountains. The question is not the Father's ability. The question is about his people's faith. Will Jesus find faith? Did he find it in his disciples? Did he find it in all the different villages that he went to? When he came to his own, when he came to the temple, did he find faith? No. He didn't find faith in the temple. He found systems and mechanisms of power. And that's what we do. When we don't believe God is going to deliver on his promises, what do we do? We leverage the situation. We insert our own systems and machines to bring about the results that God himself said he was going to bring about. So we go into the temple and we extort people. Why do we need more money? Why do we need to charge a tax? Why do we need to inflate things for the foreigners? To make sure we're well taken care of, right? When what did Jesus say? When you go to your father in prayer, pray this way. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What does he say about daily sustenance? Give us this day our daily bread. But just by nature, we hoard and we save. There's nothing wrong with saving. It's wise to save. But if our saving and our hoarding and our jacking up the tax is because we're just afraid God's not going to provide for us, we're faithless. That's what Jesus is addressing. And this is what he wants his disciples to see and the church to see and our church to see. That we should be expecting him and everything about our worship should ooze that we expect Jesus and that we depend on him. Does it? Does our church reflect that? Does the American evangelical church reflect that? There's an old song by a guy named Wayne Watson. Some of you know I, I like Wayne Watson. Some of you may have heard of him. But he wrote a song called Would I Know You Now? Listen to the words. Would I know you now if you walked into the room? If you stilled the crowd? If your light dispelled the gloom? And if I saw your wounds touched your thorn-pierced brow? I wonder, would I know you now? Would I know you now if you walked into this place? Would I cause you shame? Would my games be your disgrace? Or would I worship you and fall upon my face? I wonder, would I know you now? Or have the images I've painted so distorted who you are that even if the world was looking, they could not see you, the real you? Have I changed the true reflection to fulfill my own design, making you what I want, not showing you forth divine? Would I miss you now if you turned and closed the door? Would my flesh cry out, I don't need you anymore? Or would I follow you? Could I be restored? I wonder, would I know you now? What a, what a fitting question for the church today, for all of us. The comparison that Jesus makes between the Herodian temple to the house of prayer is extended to the discussion about the olive tree. Now Jesus is building his church. He says as much to his disciples. 
I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He wants his disciples, the apostles, to understand the essence of what he is building. He's not building a Herodian temple of gold and marble and cedar beams and all of the things that you would have found in a temple in that day. That's not what he's building. And the church will face times of extreme adversity and times of unique prosperity and privilege. But the truth still remains. It will not be established by might. It will not be established by power. By human ability. Or human ingenuity. It will only be established by the Spirit of God. The same is true for your life and for my life. Your plans will not be established. You may have really good systems working in your life right now. Maybe it looks a little bit like the temple, maybe not so much like the temple. It was, listen, what was going on in the temple when Jesus came in, what he disrupted, what he disrupted was a well-oiled machine. It was working. And it was working well. And it was working well, supposedly, for the glory of the one true God. It was at least being done in his name. The church will only be established by the Spirit of God, and your life will only be established by the Spirit of God. Are your systems, your ingenuities, your plans, submitted to the Spirit of God? If your plans... And your systems are not being submitted to the Spirit of God. As we move down into our text, verse 20, they're revisiting the, the olive tree. They come back out of the city. Jesus had already cursed the olive tree. Remember what he said? May no one ever eat fruit from you again. They come back through. Peter says, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Look at what happened to the olive tree. The Bible says it withered from where? From the roots up. It wasn't just not bearing fruit. It had lost its complete sense of purpose and life. If you're not being led by the Spirit, your roots are dead. Your life is not on the trajectory that God wants it to be. And if your roots are dead, you will not bear fruit. And your life will not be a good life. It will not lead to goodness. It will, it will lead to disappointment and death and separation from God. And God doesn't want that for you. He doesn't want that for anybody. And so he invites us through his son Jesus Christ to believe in Christ, to surrender our life to Christ so that we might be led by the Spirit and that when he comes again, he will find faith. He will find faith in you. He will find faith in your household. He will find faith in your church. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for his return? Now as we move down, we get into some really difficult verses. As a matter of fact, an entire denomination has been founded upon a misunderstanding of verses 23 and 24 about prayer. This is, this is why having a canon sense, understanding what's going on here with the rest of the Word of God is so important for us today. Or else we will be led headlong into heresy and disillusion. Now, he talks about mountains being moved. Now, isn't it interesting in verse 22? If you find it interesting in verse 22, just nod your head. Just say, Luke, you're not the only one, Okay. Truly I say, he, he says in verse 22, he answered saying, have faith in God. What kind of answer is that? When Peter says, look at the tree, it's withered. Jesus answers. It's not random. He's answering him. Have faith in God. Now some would say, well, well, he's telling Peter, hey Peter, if you have the faith that I do, you can command fig trees to wither and they will. That's not what's going on here. 
God is saying to his disciples, don't be like the fig tree, don't be like the temple, don't be like the money changers, don't be like the priests. Have faith in God. Live every day in expectation of my return and live every day believing that everything you need, you already have. He's given it to you. Be ready. Be ready. Be grateful. Be filled up. Know that you're lacking in nothing when you're in Christ. That's what he wants you to know today. You have nothing to lack. In Christ. You have everything in Christ. Believe that He's given you everything. Everything that you need. Now, this is a key verse to understand with what Jesus is saying here because He says in verse 23 Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up. Now, most scholars believe He's pointing to the Mount of Olives because they were right there. Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea. If you do that without doubting, that word in verse 23 is really important, with no, with no doubt. It's the Greek word diakrino. Krino means to judge. And so what Jesus is saying there is he's not saying if you close your eyes and go, please, 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 please. Right? And do it again. And do it again. Right? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about whenever you pray, if you don't pray with a divided, that's dia, krino, with a divided judgment with a divided heart, with a divided mind. That's faith. Faith is not having a divided mind, but believing that God is sovereign, that he's going to provide. It's not hedging your bets. Right? And that's what was happening in the temple. Why are we charging? People didn't bring their own animals because there was a risk involved. I'd rather just show up with cash. That way I can buy two turtle doves or I can buy a ram or I can buy a bull or whatever it is, depending upon what kind of sacrifice you're making. I'm just going to bring cash. This is a good system. Didn't have to bring your animals. Just bring cash. Show up to the table. They'll give you a good deal. Maybe. Maybe. It's a good system. Hedging your bets. I know at least if I show up to the temple with cash, I will get a sacrifice that's approved by the priest and we can get this done. It's going to happen. Why did the priest charge for it? Why was there a temple tax? Because we're just not sure God's going to provide everything that we need. So let's get some money making on the side. Hedging your bets. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying to his disciples, don't operate that way. He will take care of you. The house of the Lord is supposed to be a house of prayer, waiting, dependence, not business, not quick, easy, efficient. Sometimes that's what we like, even in the religious realm. How long is the sermon going to be? When are they going to let out? Are we going to have lunch after? Can I get to this place by the end? Busyness, busyness, busyness going from one place to the next. In some ways, this hasn't changed. But Jesus says his church is to be different. To be different. It takes time. If the Lord's house is a house of prayer, it's a house of dependence. Of daily sustenance. Not hoarding. Daily rhythms of spending time in God's word. Weekly rhythms of being with God's people on the Sabbath. Wor worshiping him. And so he talks about this mountain. Hold your place there and go to Zechariah 4. This is really important. The whole book of Zechariah is pointing to the Messiah. But it also talks about the dreams that Zechariah has because Zechariah, we find out in other places in, in, in Ezra, in Ezra 5.2, don't go to Ezra 5.2, keep going to Zechariah 4. But in Ezra 5.2, talks about uh, Zerubbabel and uh, how he is in charge of rebuilding the house of God. Okay? That is his task. The house of God which is in Jerusalem. You can find that in Ezra 5.2. But Zechariah talks about Zerubbabel as well. 
So this is a, a dream, a vision. Zechariah 4.1 Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and aroused, and roused me as a man who is awakened from his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? And I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand, all of gold, with its bowl on top of it, and its seven lamps on it, with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on top of it. Also two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. Now verse 4. Then I answered and said to the angel who was speaking with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Verse 5. So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Now remember who Zerubbabel is. The one who's been tasked with building the temple. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountain? Before Serubabel, you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. You think Jesus might be hearkening back to Zechariah? Zerubbabel, a man who's supposed to be building the temple? How are we going to do this? How can there be a temple worthy of the glory of God? It seems impossible, the task. And the message to Zerubbabel is what? It's not by might, nor by power, but how? By my spirit, says the Lord. The mountain is nothing when you operate by the Spirit. When the Spirit of the Lord is leading His people and His people are submitted to Him, the mountains melt away. So when Jesus says this to His disciples, He's not saying to them, hey, if you pray with faith like I do, you can make an olive tree wither. And hey, if you pray like I do, if you just have the faith that I do, you can move mountains. Hey, you should try it. Cast that mountain into the Sea of Galilee. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the Lord of hosts has you. He has your back. Put your faith in him. Expect great things from him. Know that he's done great things for you. So, here are the things. Number one, don't panic when you face persecution, nor fold when you receive favor. The Jewish people had received favor from Herod. They had received favor from the Greek-speaking world, from the Romans, the governors. They had received favor. When Jesus goes to the cross, they betray him, but they betray him to a Ro Roman governor named Pontius Pilate. There are going to be times in your life, and our times in, in the Christian church, we look back on history where the, where the world treated us with favor. Kings and emperors and whoever. And those things can cause us to, to glory in worldly things and, and go into a type of panic mode. To put our trust in the things of the world. In the Old Testament, we have the earliest example of this type of rejection of worldly support in Abraham. Before he is called Abraham, he was Abram. And in Genesis 14, 22 through 23, the Bible tells us of a, of a story where Abraham's nephew Lot and his family were captured by some invading kings. And Abram takes his army of 300 and something some odd men and they go and they rescue Lot and they rescue the people that belong to all these other uh, kingdom uh, cities and the king of Sodom comes out and, and tries to strike a deal with, with Abram. Listen to what it says. After receiving back from Lot, the king said to Sodom, or I'm sorry, the king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people to me that you rescued. Take all the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high possessor of heaven and earth. That's so important. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He possesses it all. I have sworn to him that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours lest you should say I have made Abram rich. Brothers and sisters, there are going to be times of great affluence for the church at our fingertips. And there have been many, many years before we came to this earth. Don't panic. 
when you either face persecution or great favor. That's what Jesus is preparing his disciples for here. Don't be like those money changers in the temple. Don't be like those priests. Have faith in God. Believe in God. In all, through all of this. Through the persecution, through the favor, keep your eyes focused on God. Be Christ-centered. Know what it means that God is omnipotent. All the ability that you need is in the Father. The second thing, don't innovate to the point of inoculation. What is that? A point of inoculation where, you know, you, re you, you receive something so many times that you're just, you're numb to it. This is what happened in Israel. They had, they, they, they winged it so many times in worship. It just became natural. In Malachi, we find them disdainfully poking at the altar. They're tired. They're weary of doing the work of the Lord. They're just like, we find the doors to the temple are hanging off the hinges. They're not keeping it up. And now when Jesus enters into the temple, it looks completely different than what it should have in receiving the Lord of Lord and the King, the King of Kings into its doors. Mm. The church, for the church and for Christians, there's always this temptation to innovate. I'll remind you of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. David, the young shepherd boy, is offered Saul's armor because that's how, they, that's how they did things. You put on armor, you go out, you fight. That's how we do things. So when David goes out, he doesn't put on Saul's armor. He goes with what he knows. He goes with what the Lord has always given him to defend the flock. And so he goes out and he defends the flock of God. He fights for the children of Israel. Listen to his words. Because Goliath, the giant, who's also clad in all of that stuff, that this is what you wear when you go out. A sword, a shield, a javelin, armor, a helmet. Goliath laughs at him. He says, you come to me with sticks? Listen to what little David says. You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Cover your ears, kids. And, all, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. I will give the dead bodies of the armies of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Amen? Do not innovate to the point of inoculation. Just being numb. We don't even know what we're doing anymore. Jesus says to his disciples, depend on me. Stick with the plan. There is a mission. And it's a mystery. And the message sounds foolish. It sounds silly. It's going to cause some to stumble. It's going to cause some to laugh at you and say, you're crazy. You're unreasonable. But that message will save souls. It is the power unto salvation. And then finally, don't pretend to be someone you're not. We didn't drill down into this very much. It's the last two verses. And for time, we're not going to drill down too much. But what is he saying to them? When you go into the temple, all of the business that's happening is there, but there's also the standing and the praying. I mean, it's still a religious event to offer sacrifices, to stand and to pray. And he, he says on other accounts, he says, the hypocrites love to stand and pray on the street corner in order to be seen by men. They love to stand in the temple in order to be seen by men. They've just been inoculated into this hypocritical system that, that that's what holy men do. It's not about the prayer closet. It's not about coming into worship and waiting to hear the voice of the Lord. It's about doing. It's about innovating. It's about performance. It's about business. And prayer was one part of that. 
They would stand, be recognized by everyone, and pray in public. And so he says, when you stand to pray, forgive. Forgive. Don't leverage power. Don't extort. Forgive. If, if you are praying to the God who chose you, the least of all nations, out of nothing, rescued you from the house of slavery, this would be Jesus' message to those in the temple. If God has done this for you, how dare you stand and pray to that God who is impartial, who hates false weights and scales and exchanges, who hates hypocrisy. How can you stand and pray like that? When you stand, disciples, when you stand, church, forgive. Know the God that you're praying to. That he forgives you. That he forgives. Don't pretend to be someone that you're not. This was an issue as early as two decades, within two decades of him saying this. We find it in Paul's letter to the Galatian church. He's confronting hypocrisy. And he even sees it in one of the apostles. He asks the question, are you so foolish? Galatians, having begun by the Spirit, you are now being perfected by the flesh. The house of the Lord is a house of prayer. It is a house where the Spirit dwells. And the people of God, when we come together in community to worship Him, He says we should worship Him in spirit and in truth. Let's continue to worship Him in spirit and in truth. To realize the power of God in our presence. To know that He has given us all things and that we will survive and we will thrive when we are a people of prayer, completely dependent upon the Lord. We will experience power in the Christ-centered life. Do you know Him today? Do you know the presence of God in your life? Are you being led by the Spirit of the Lord? The Bible says that you can through faith. Through faith, you can have all that Jesus provides, full forgiveness of sin, full pardon, no past. If there's someone bringing up your past over and over in your mind and heart, you can know this, it's not God. It's the enemy. And you might say, well, you have no idea what I've done. Doesn't matter. He does. And it's not that your past doesn't matter, but he just doesn't care about it. When it comes to making you righteous before the Father, He wipes every sin away. Live in that truth. You don't have to come up with systems in your life for self-preservation. He'll take care of you. And church, He will take care of us. Do you believe it? Amen.